Welcome to the culture of you. Meaningful dialogue with me and my favorite people. All right, everyone, welcome to the culture of you. And today I have one of my favorite people and poets ever. So today we have Barbara Fant, writer, performer, poet, community healer, community builder, community leader, voice. Wait, just wait. I'm gonna let y'all wait a few more minutes till y'all hear her voice. And she is a World Poetry Slam finalist. She has two poetry collections. I have them both. You should get them. A feature and most notably Button Poetry and Deaf Poetry Jam has received residencies in Havana, Cuba and Senegal, West Africa. She led informed poetry workshops for youth and adults who are incarcerated, those in community, adults in recovery, and survivors of human trafficking and domestic violence. She is a healing-centered engagement specialist and master of fine arts and poetry and a master of theology mixing all of the good things in there founder of the black women rise poetry collective co-founder of the singer project west african international artist residency and co-founder of we thrive healing and arts collective you're welcome everyone for having this person on this podcast today in national poetry month barbara fan how you doing hey i'm doing good i'm doing good doing real good it's good to see you and yes. it's good to to just be here vibing out, talking all things poetry. Yes, <laughs> yes absolutely poetry. So first things first, um, I asked you, it's National Poetry Month, so that was a no-brainer to ask you to come on and be on in this month for me. This is probably my eighth episode of the podcast, but uh, what made you say yes? It's you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, seriously, like, why... Why would I say no to anything you asked me to do? One. um, Noted. (laughs) And then, yeah, like when, you know, if you get an opportunity to come on to talk to a fellow writer, to talk to a fellow healer, community builder, why not? You know? And so I I really just wanted to learn more about what this was and to get a chance to talk to you. That's really all it was. I love that. Yeah. It's been too long. I haven't seen you. If y'all don't know. Barbara left Columbus, Ohio. She left us, but she left for bigger things, bigger things. She's in LA and we are so happy for her. And we, we hopefully sent you off proper. Um, but Absolutely. tell us a little bit for those maybe who don't know you, how would you mm-hmm. define your vibe? I'll say vibe, like in the world, in the streets. And mm-hmm. then at work, how would you like, say you create culture, community and professionally. So I think vibe is the same as culture creating in the workplace and in the community, Mm -hmm. but how would you describe that personally and professionally? Yeah, thanks for that question. I think I would consider myself um, a bridge builder. So when I think about like my work in the world and who I am in the world, I would say my vibe is consistently somebody who's like a bridge builder. I'm constantly trying to pull together multiple different worlds and to see how they work. And that's probably because internally I feel like I come from multiple different worlds Mm. and I'm constantly trying to blend those things in my own life and so naturally that's how I show up in community as well Mm. um and then I would say my vibe is probably like healing centered is that a good way to describe a vibe that's a good way to describe a vibe you got more words for that let's see okay I'm gonna use also I think what's coming up for me is like colors Mm. So I'm thinking of like yellows and oranges and like, I think that reminds me of joy. So trying to like always show up in that way. Um, And so I would probably describe my vibe as someone who tries to be a keeper and carrier of joy. Ooh, that's like a new work title. Like I want to put that (laughs) like on a business card. A A joy keeper. Oh, that's so great. Okay. <laughs> so the next question I'm going to ask you is when you think of your favorite self or like mm-hmm. your full self, so you're a keeper mm-hmm. of joy, right? And you think of your favorite and full self. I say favorite because best to me always feels like what maybe society has projected onto me, but your mm-hmm. favorite self, when you love yourself, when you're with yourself, what mm-hmm are the characteristics or what's going on? Obviously you have some maybe yellow and on, you know, but like, 
what other things are going on in your mind or in your world or around you mm-hmm. when you're showing up as your favorite self and how do you get to that place? Oh my gosh, I love that question. When I'm showing up as my favorite self, I am my most centered. I'm my most grounded. I'm also my most authentic, meaning I'm able to show up fully in all of who I am. And I think in so many different parts of my life, I have to compartmentalize probably Mm -hmm. like lots of people, right? Right. Um, But I think for me, for years, I've always been like the the person of faith or the the faith poet in Mm -hmm. a secular world, right? And so sometimes I was too spiritual for the secular world, but then I was too secular for the faith community. So I think, but my best self is both of those things fully. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm able to show up fully in all of that, I think that is like my favorite self, right? And I'm my most at peace. So things in my world have a steady flow. And And they're like, they're working together. I'm not, I'm, I'm always doing something from a space of purpose and mm-hmm. intention, right? Yeah. I'm living out that full intention and um, I'm showing up fully. Cause I think I, there's been times in my life where, um, and you, you know, this is somebody who's lives in multiple different worlds, right? Mm-hmm. We can just be doing a bunch of things. And then we like, are so busy and burn out. And then we're like, what the heck? Why did I even say yes to all those things? What the heck was I doing? And you realize you weren't doing it from that centered intentional space. Yeah, You were doing it because you felt like, oh, I have to, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And what I'm realizing now, as I'm getting older, that has come from this people pleasing space that has come yes. from this, like what society was projecting on me space. Right. So Um, I think in my fullness, my most full self, I'm doing everything with intention and I can answer why I'm doing it. Mm, I love that piece. And that that makes me think of discernment and just the ability to be able to be like, this is actually what I want to do and I'm doing it because I want to do it. And I think there was a time probably in the beginning of, and I think in in part in the beginning of every career, Mm -hmm. whether it be the arts or like being public in my career, I've been writing, you know, since I was a kid, but like yeah. actually being public in my art space where I was like, oh, I need the exposure. I need to be known in this way. And now I'm like so strategic and like, yes. do I really want to do this? And it's rarely ever about the money. Right. It's normally like, is this the right thing for me right now with the right people? Oof, that's so good. That's so good. And being able to answer that for yourself yeah. and realizing like, I don't owe this to anybody else. I don't owe an explanation to anybody mm-hmm. else. Like I just need to, when I go home, it's me, myself. You know, I need to be able to look myself in the mirror and be able to answer that for myself. Yes. I'm just like thinking of all the things that and I have FOMO. <laughs> I have FOMO sometimes because I'm like, I I love people. Like I love the community. I love the connection. I love the the energy and the joy and like the the environment of of art specifically. And there are sometimes when I'm like, that's a really good opportunity. But I told myself this month that I wasn't going to take any more things. Mm. And I want to, I promise that to myself. And my nervous system is like, remember what you said. And then like, you know, and then my, my heart is like, but I want to be there (laughs) and I want to participate and I want to show up there. So that's, that's, as I get older, that is definitely something similar. I feel something similar. That gut response will always remind you though. It's that first feeling that is always going to bring you back to center, you know, mm-hmm. and, and listening to that. So that's what I'm learning to do. I, I have FOMO too. Like, I mean, completely, especially like, I mean, I've only been out here. It'll be two years in August. Right. And I feel like the whole first year I was in LA, I was physically here, but my mind and my heart was in Columbus because I was trying to like, <laughs> I'm just catching all the videos. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> you know, but I, I have that. I, I completely resonate with that. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I have fear of missing out on, on lots of different things, but also I know what it's like to show up in a million different spaces and to say yes to everything. And then I'm not showing up fully. Exactly. When and that's I show not up what they asked for. 
You know what I'm saying? I'm mm-hmm. getting paid, maybe getting getting paid, but I'm only showing up as a partial me. Mm-hmm. I can't even fully give myself on a microphone or to people in a space for a Q&A or I can't give myself fully to the space. So I don't, and I don't like that feeling. I don't like showing up right. halfway. Exactly. So this brings me to my next question. Good leading. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I've watched you perform. I've seen you live. I've seen you on video. And there is this dynamic shift when you go into performer mode. Mm-hmm. And um, in, in the interest of not uh, leaning secular, I will say that there's some sort of spiritual ancestral channel that mm-hmm. you can see kind of happening as that. And people have said that similarly around there, but I know you're the voice for a lot of, you know, nonprofit things. And and you might just randomly hear your voice on the radio or like in an ad. And you're like, that sounds like Barbara Fant. But like, how do you, what is that shift? What, how is that happening in your body? Like, what do you know is happening in that space? And as you've honed in on that, not necessarily persona, but that, that performance persona or that performance energy, what does that look like for you? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think when I started performing, I didn't know what my voice was going to sound like on the stage. You know, I <laughs> I really just wanted to get up there and like do something, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, when I found Black Pearl Poetry and I met it said, I ended mm-hmm. up getting on an open mic and haven't left the stage since I was 18 years old, you know? And I had no clue. Like I I didn't have a real voice, I don't think, at that time. And one of the things it said used to say to me all the time is, you know, you have to go and listen to other voices so that you can know yours. Mm. And so that's what I did. I would visit like, I would go to like four or five open mics a week. Because at that time, at that time in Columbus, you could go see poetry like four or five nights a week. Yes. And I was there, you know, Mm -hmm. and then I started slamming. And I think when I started slamming, it it started help helping me to hone my voice too. Mm -hmm. And I started writing from an even more authentic space. Wow. And when I started writing from an even deeper and more authentic space, and I and I started to resonate with the fact like, oh, this is healing for me. This is cathartic. This is doing something in my body. And mm-hmm. now it's doing something for me to not just get it out on a page, but to get it out on stage. I started using that energy like on stage. And so I, I think it just comes from me like a release and me getting something out of my body. Mm. Um, but it, so I think that's, that's probably like what the energy is, mm-hmm. is it, it is, it comes from that, um, it's coming from a deep space, like what I'm writing, but, but I had to, I worked to get there, right. I worked to get there. That wasn't something that just automatically happened, but as my writing shifted, my voice on stage shifted. Ooh. Well, add your lived experience. My lived experience. Yeah. You have, you have more living, you lived more. And then absolutely you, you tell, I mean, it's not guttural, but it's like, you come from a different place deeper you go within yourself living yeah and I I always say like I write to heal but Mm -hmm. that there's something about the witnessing and the community aspect that is like enlarging on like a bigger than me scale yes yes I I agree with that and I always said that I I write to heal too but but now I'm looking at it and I love that kind of right to witness um, but mm. I'm I'm also looking at it now as like, oh, I am a storyteller in yes. a way that I never saw myself. I actually never really saw myself as a storyteller. Mm-hmm. And I'm just now realizing like, oh, no, I, I am a, a storyteller and a, a person who is a uh, a holder and keeper of of store of stories. Right. Mm-hmm. And um, and so I'm stepping into that a lot more fully, too, and realizing like, hey, like, people aren't going to know these stories unless we, the community Mm -hmm. tell them and bring them forth. And so, so I'm looking at my writing a lot like that lately as of late. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's it's shifting and changing my voice again. You know, Barbara Fant with the griot energy, (laughs) griot energy. And then like, I feel like griot, 
an elder. And even though I, I'll oh never goodness. see myself as an elder, I feel like that starts to come down. I'm like, oh, I feel like those are synonymous, like Gria, elder, wait, just 40. But no, for real. It, it, is so, it is so funny because, you know, it's funny when you got poets that come to me like, oh, yeah, you an OG. I'm like, what? Like, I'm, no, uh, huh? what? <laughs> you know, like, and it's like, it's, fu- it's funny, you know what I mean? But like I said, I've been at this work since I was 18 years old, you know, mm-hmm. and I was never, I was not a, I did not slam on a youth scene. I didn't grow yeah. up in that. I was right. a youth, young, I was a young person slamming on an adult scene. Wow. You know? So there were folks who came up around me that I slammed with, who slammed in Brave New Voices, who slammed in Cup C and all that, mm-hmm. but I never did that. We didn't really have that in Columbus, Ohio. So I was yeah. straight on the adult scene. So my voice probably also was cultivated by folks who were 10 plus years older than me. You yeah. Know? I had to come, if I was going to beat them in the slam, I had to come with it. I'm, you know, you think about, I'm like up against yeah. the Braswells, Kim Braswell, you know, Vernell Bristol, you know what I'm saying? Will come Evans. On. I was saying against Will, like, you know what I'm saying? To get on teams. Like, who does that? Like, you know. <laughs> on purpose. <laughs> purpose like I signed up to go do that like huh you know (laughs) oh and while we're here for this moment just um in a moment of of reverence and an honor and homage to to Isid do you want to say anything about Isid (sighs) sure I mean I can say so many things but Isid um is a a legend you Mm -hmm. know and he cultivated my voice I literally would have never stepped on a stage had it not been for him Mm-hmm. You know, I ended up sitting next to him randomly at Black Pro Poetry in 2006, mm-hmm. uh, I think, you know, and uh, it's a funny story, but it, I didn't know who he was. I randomly ended up sitting next to him and then they introduced like the godfather of poetry coming to the stage and then this <laughs> old man who's next to me gets up and spits this fire poem. You know what I'm saying? And it comes in since back now, like nothing ever happened. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, that was amazing. Like, what in the world, you know? We're just going to act like that didn't happen, We're just going to act like sir? that didn't happen, for real? He sir? Said, he said, uh, oh, thank you, sister. Thank you, sister. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, he invited me to New Harvest Cafe the next day and asked me if I was a writer, you know, and if I'd ever shared. And I was like, nah, I've never shared, but I write. And I met him at New Harvest Cafe with several other folks the next day and mm-hmm. did my first open mic. And I haven't, I haven't left the stage since that time. And he's consistently been a, a mentor, uh, a father when I mm-hmm. needed it, a friend. And um, yeah, he's always going to hold a deep, special place in my heart. So yeah. thank you. Thank you for leaving space. Yeah. The community that. is mourning. His his loss. And, you know, we know that means he gets to go and be the shape and the size that he already was yes. in human form yes. and spirit form. So we we are grateful for him as an ancestor and grateful for him and mentoring and fathering and, and being a, a confidant to you and a yeah. a supporter and an amplifier of you. And so we we see the fruits, you know, we talk about oh. the fruits and that's beautiful. That's a beautiful moment. I definitely wanted to I actually didn't have that in the notes, but that that just oh, made made thank sense you. to thank you so much. to happen right now. So moving on appropriately to the next yeah. question, poetry as a healing mechanism. Um, you say, let me get this quote right. I don't want to quote you wrong. Um, I pray in the form of poems. Yeah, yeah. Like poetry is prayer. Yes. Um, yeah. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I think that comes from being, you know, when my mother passed, I was 15, right? And um, my father was going through through some things. It was just a lot happening, right? Mm -hmm. And I was just like, I need to go to counseling. You know, I need therapy, you know? Mm -hmm. And my dad was like, you're not going to therapy, you're going to church you know, and that was his way of, of handling things. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know how to communicate to God. Like I didn't know how to pray. I didn't know how to talk about what I was experiencing. So I started writing and what I would do is I would go to church and I would take notes on the sermon 
And then I would go back home and write those into a poem. And that mm. became my way of like processing what the pastor was even saying. Right. Yeah. And then I started writing to God. I was like, well, I can't really talk mm. to people. So I'm going to write it out this way. I'm just going to like, this is how I'm going to communicate. And yeah. literally that's what it was for me. Mm. So writing for me started as this journey of prayer and as a way to process what I was, what I was really working through. Um, and so it still carries me to this day. I don't mm -hmm. journal. I've never been a, a person who journals. Mm -hmm. I have a hard time keeping a journal. Actually, I've tried <laughs> many times. And I, <laughs> it won't happen. Like the only thing that comes out are poems. Like I just end up writing a poem. So if Same. I challenge myself to write a poem a day, that's cool. Like I could do that. You want me to journal every day? It will that's be a poem. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? For sure. So, so for me, even now, like talking to guys, sometimes if I have a block or if I'm like, I'm just, I really am working through this thing. It's just not working. Like I write. Mm -hmm. um, and it's still my way of, of communicating to God. Yeah. On the move, I had to like learn. That's so beautiful. I had to learn how to like maybe put it in my notes because I might be on the move. And I, I just was like, I had to get away from the perfection of it needing to be a finished product and start being able to like, write whatever was coming and I wax poetic even in like facilitating <laughs> or like yeah, yeah, yeah. you know and that's yep, just yep. that's just what you are like they're like that was really poetic and I'm like oh, it's just okay it's it's like right like right this is a keynote about diversity equity and inclusion <laughs> it's a poem that's right that's uh, right that's right but then like leaning into so it sounds like you like internally process and I, I love that that you were you were finding a way to process kind of those notes and make it make sense and understand it. And then also like communicate mm -hmm. with God in that way. And then how did that lead into like trauma informed care and like healing, like you're a healing centered engagement specialist. Like that's <laughs> a very specific title. How does that, how does that turn into that? Yeah, that's, that's just a certification. I okay, 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 okay. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. <laughs> <laughs> but shout out to Sean Jen Ray, who uh, started the Flourishing uh, Fl Flourish Agenda in Oakland, California, whose training mm -hmm. I went through um, by way of, you know, L.A. County. So thank you for that. But, um, you know, honestly, I think I think about, too, like some of my first my first jobs. Right. Yeah. And really, my first job in Columbus. Check this. So it said used to take me everywhere. OK. Right? And I ended up going to this school with him one day and he had, it said in the advance party, which was his group. Okay. So Frida Ayodele was dancing with him and she worked at this arts organization and was like, hey, what are you up to this summer? And I was like, uh, <laughs> look for a job. You know, so she was like, she was like, come to the office, you know, next week uh -huh. and do this interview. Had no clue what it was for. And it ended up being this organization called Art Safe, Art for Child Safe America, mm. where we went into schools and youth correctional facilities teaching art as a form of healing. Come on. Right. And so I ended up getting that job as an artist assistant. Mm -hmm. And my the lead teaching artist was Lauren Iman. Shout out yeah. to Lauren, who works Love at Lauren. the museum, who's yeah. known me since that time, since I was like 19 years old. Okay. And I was her assistant. And we used to go into Scioto Correctional Institution every, every week, teaching art as a form of healing. Wow. And we ran summer programs. And so she's like, I she won't say this, but I'm going to say this. She was okay. really like my first teacher. Yeah. you know, in that space. So she taught me really the art of facilitation and the mm -hmm. art of doing workshops and how we can use this work that's already healing informed mm -hmm. in practice, yeah. right? And share it with other young people so that they can write through their trauma and create through their trauma and paint through their trauma to, mm -hmm. to, to get to a place of healing. Mm. And that's what we did. I mean, back in those, you know, I'm sounding like I'm old saying back in those days, but <laughs> back then, you know what I mean? We did have like, you know, a D I think we had a DVD. I don't think it was a VHS. It was a DVD player. Mm -hmm. And we used to bring in like HBO deaf poetry videos and just let them watch. And then we would do prompts based off of that. And these mm -hmm. are young people who are incarcerated. 
Yeah. You know, so I think my journey even started then. So I, I do consider it such a gift to have been able to like randomly be in that space because yeah. fast forward over 15 years later, I'm still doing that work. It's like you that know? divine gift. That's like Barbara <laughs> and that gets just <laughs> handed to you. That's like, that's yeah, that was, that was for you specifically you know, some divine timing. Isn't that wild? You that know, is wild. It's, it's so wild. So to still to still be working and teaching art as a form of healing and you know, specifically mass incarceration spaces is yeah. just like, man, it's it's something. It's something. That's so wild. I don't even remember what the initial question was, but I know it took me back to that. Nope. Space. You answered it okay, perfectly. Good. Okay. <laughs> um, so let's let's shift. I love, I love knowing these things about you and loving, love knowing these connections and it's all, all the pieces make sense now. <laughs> um, Cause I, you know, kind of came onto the scene really in that space in like 2012. Mm. Um, Cause I was, came back here to get my master's at Ohio state and I was still educational policy and leadership. So I'm a math nerd. Yes. Um, math degree undergrad and then educational policy and leadership. And then I was like, I need somewhere for my thespian, like yes. <laughs> artist self to go. <laughs> and so I love that the open mic scene was what it was. I also did um, some performance arts, you know, I do some improv comedy yeah. and drumming and all that kind of stuff, but it was Columbus was so loving to me and they always mm-hmm. made me feel like I lived here. I've been here mm-hmm. and I love that about Columbus, but I want to move into the community space. And when you think about, like community healing, I think the question that I want to ask you is, do you have best practices? Like I know for a while it was like you were just kind of hanging on the trails. They said was taking you around. And then (laughs) you were like, this is cool. This is cool. Meet new people. Cool job. Help people help all these people probably that, you know, the numbers stack up. But like, do you when did you start to be like really intentional around that and mm. and start to realize like, oh, this is this is my gift and let me let my gift make room for me. And how can I be intentional about creating these community spaces? Oh, that's that's really a good question. I don't know. I don't know if it's when I realized I don't know exactly when I realized it. I think. Maybe when. I realized I had something to offer. Mm-hmm. that was um that that I could offer something more than just what I'm doing on a stage in that mm-hmm. way but that like what was happening in these open mic spaces what's happening in these workshop spaces is that culture is being shifted and people are connecting in a different way right and yeah. so I think I realized when I had somewhat of a the I'm not going to have the best word for it, but not like not platform, but like c- or ability to connect people mm-hmm. like that, that I re- that I came from multiple different worlds and that I that knew plug like energy. All these different- <laughs> That's that plug, plug energy. energy. You got the griot energy. You got the plug energy. More that's of so, that. That's so funny. I appreciate that. I don't know. I just like I just realized like, oh, I have multiple worlds I can bring together in Mm -hmm. multiple different spaces. And, you know, I was at the, you know, I was at the foundation for seven years. I was at the Columbus foundation for seven years. Yeah. And then realized like how many folks, you know, I saw filtering through there, how many Mm -hmm. people wanted to connect, how many people wanted to build. And I could watch and see how these connections were being built. And then I could say like, Oh, I, I have that in me. Like I can do that. Like, you know, and so I started realizing that. Mm-hmm. And um, and became a, more of a convener, I would say, of spaces. And um, I'll just go back to that word, like bridge builder. You know, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So um, this is the the last question I'll ask. So expound as you like. Um, but okay. so I, there's a lot of collectives. So you have the Black Woman Rise Poetry Collective and the We Thrive Healing and Arts Collective. When I think about like collective it's definitely different from like, a, like it's an intentional space. It may have specific demographics that are being, or diversity dimensions that are being like, you know, focused on in those yeah. spaces. What is your, like you're in these spaces. How does this go from idea or vision to fruition? Mm. And like, what is your vision in creating these spaces to like, what need is that meeting? And what it, mm. what is your vision for us on a, like on the scale that you're doing it now, but then further out. 
Oh, I love this question. That's so good. Um, you know, so the so the Black Woman Rights Poetry Collective that became a thing. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a thing. <laughs> I had no vision for that. You know, it wasn't mm-hmm. a thing. It was literally during COVID, mm-hmm. and I didn't. I wanted to hold myself accountable. I didn't want to not be writing during those right. months. So I was like, hey, how can I reach out to folks? So I reached out to like 13, 14 people and were like, hey, y'all want to write a poem a day with me? Okay, great. And like hold each other. <laughs> That's really what it was, right? Right. Writing buddies. <laughs> really writing buddies. And then what happened is folks didn't want to stop. Mm. They wanted to keep going after 30 days. They wanted to like still do, you know, share resources and still edit yeah. and like let's communicate, let's convene, let's do this, let's do that. And then the opportunity came up for us to do a show at the Lincoln and it became something. I had to name it something because it was like, oh, we have, we're doing this show now. Now it's a thing, you know? That was and phenomenal. Then, oh, thank you so, so phenomenal. Much. I got to see it virtually because all the tickets were sold out, but wow. <laughs> wow. It, it was, it was something, you know, and we didn't know what it was going to be. It was just something, you know, and then it was you know, freedom all a card. And then this mm-hmm. organization, you know what I'm saying? So folks started wanting to contract with us and do things. Mm-hmm. And then it became a thing. And right. so um I think I think for me, I'm just now realizing that um there has like when you have vision, you also need to have somewhat of a strategy. Yeah. And so I had to almost reverse engineer like that collective to figure out exactly what it was going to be and what it can be. But I think to answer the question around like, what is my hope for like all of these spaces is I want, I want to create a space for people to like heal and thrive Mm -hmm. and be their best selves. Mm -hmm. Right. And so even back to the other question you had asked earlier, I was thinking about um, offering space and like platform or mm-hmm. other voices, right? Like how can we be carriers of, or just holders of, of, of giving space for people for, for their voices yes, to, to be heard as well? Like how mm-hmm. can we do that? And yeah. so that's, those are things that I'm constantly thinking about. Like how do we get more voices heard? Because once you're like a steward of that, like once you move from like, oh, this is a place where I got free or this is a place where I healed. Yeah. It's like, of course you want to give back. And of course you want to give back to people, especially that have similar lived experiences as you. Mm -hmm. But then it's like, what is the responsibility here? Like, what is, and that can, that can have some weight to it, but like, what is the responsibility here? And it's like, it's an instant love. Like the minute it's not in love, I'm going to be like, wait, let me check my, my footing here. You know, Right. like if this is in love, like what is, what is my stewardship look like to, to the gift I was given by somebody else? Yes. And then, and then the giving of it. Yes. And what's my, what's my responsibility? Like Mm -hmm. there's so many people who showed up for me and who took me under their wings. It said was an incredible impact on my life, but so is Will Evans, right? Mm -hmm. So is Tiffany Smith. Yes. You know, these, these folks showed up in my life and were like, I got you. (laughs) And, and they're, they used their stage. Mm-hmm. to give me space yes. and to tell me to show up in my fullest self. And that's what I'm trying to do for other people. That's mm-hmm. what I want to do for other people. So when can, when can y'all come to LA to perform? Right. right. You know what I'm right. saying? Like wherever I go, folks is coming with me, mm-hmm. you know? And I think that's, that's what it's about. Shout out to Tiffany Smith. She made all of us cry. <laughs> that poem. Do you ever just like, just turn it on and be like, man, I really had that impact on somebody. <laughs> wow. Tiffany that, is, I that can't. Poem. <laughs> Tiffany is, um, she's one of my heroes. Mm-hmm. Like she is, you know, and I'm, sure. I'm blessed that I get to like call and talk to her and just let mm-hmm. her know, like, I just, I love you. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, she really is one. She's like a hero for me. Yeah. You know, sure. and she, when I stepped on the scene, she was like legend on the scene, you yeah. know, um, she had been, she had stepped away, but she was like, she was legend, you know? Mm-hmm. 
and um, she made space for me. And she always mm. makes space for me. I always. That. That's know? the that's the gift. And that's, I think, what the responsibility winds up being is like, how can we build capacity and space within ourselves? But then how mm. can we keep giving and, and creating space for others? Right. Right. Yeah. And I and I think with the collective, what I've always wanted to do is have collective vision. Mm-hmm. Like it's not just mine. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Or it's everybody else's too. Y'all yeah. show up because y'all want to show up. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And it's it's our collective vision that that helps really heal and elevate each other. It's that collective piece of it. It's not just mm-hmm. it's not just from the individual. Yeah, and I'll take it for Columbus to me it's it's um it's where poetry became home to me you know and so and so like there there's nothing like you can't tell me that Columbus didn't didn't raise the best poets (laughs) like you can't it's some great poets it's some great poets but as a collective it's some really magical beings for real no no for real like they have made crazy noise on a national stage Mm -hmm. I mean you know what I'm saying like Hanif lives in Columbus Hanif is from Columbus you know Maggie Smith is from Columbus like you know Will Evans is from Columbus like it's it's crazy you know folks Mm -hmm. don't even like Kim Braswell, she'll never talk about it, but like when I live started, when the individual world poetry slam started, like she was like, she placed like seventh in the nation. Just a, Dude, just another day for her. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, and this was like years ago. This was before like folks was even on it like that, you know? Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's Columbus has something special. We were just talking about that on Instagram. Somebody put up a, po- a post about leaving, um, a broken English show and just oh, talking yeah. about how special like the Columbus poetry scene is and I'm like nah like that's real on so many levels we just yeah. Columbus has something special and I'm like Juggler Vert to- I'm like Scott Wood oh yeah I'm like the Ness like come on the Ness I mean at that time it was it was Black Pro Poetry that mm-hmm. Ed hosted then Will took it over then when that ended we did um, writing writing wrongs writer's block was one of it was the longest running open mic in the city yeah, it just ended a poetry few months ago forum. yeah yeah poetry forum the nest i mean mm-hmm. like so many special i mean and then two dollar radio started doing things yep. Gramercy books started doing things like there's mm-hmm. just so many um it's it's special you know it is special like the stuff that happened in those rooms the yeah. folks that came through the city that helped even cultivate our voices, like mm-hmm. seeing features, you know what I mean? I remember Will bringing in folks from other states to come and like, just talk with us and yeah, Sonia and Sanchez like, in our room, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, C.R. Freeman, I'm just thinking about like all the people, oh, yeah, that's Ohio. Kendrick. I mean, oh, yeah. that's Ohio. We give it to you, Cleveland. We give the love up for Ohio. You, know? you can name you can name a million people. You can name yeah. a, mil, a million poets who have touched the work, our lives. I'm even thinking about, and I will speak his name because some folks think about they can't talk about him. They can't talk about activism without him, but okay. I can't talk about poetry without him. And it's Marshawn McCarroll mm. who had a crazy impact on so many of our lives, but especially what a mine. powerful dynamic force he was. <laughs> uh. And and Marshawn was just like, I mean, he was Marshawn was brilliant. And he had been brilliant, like in high school. Like him mm-hmm. and his brother, his twin, used to come to like open mic. Yeah. And like just sit there. You know what I mean? Like he, I just um that yeah, he's left such a powerful impact on my life um, personally. Mm. So, but he is part of that poetry community. And then like comes a time too, like I did um, my latest book and it was, it was nuanced and it was complex. We got books, Um, (laughs) but the latest book was Fire Poetic Memoirs of a Movement. And I really Mm. did the cathartic writing healing process for the 2020 in 2021 
racial uprising, mm. social justice movement. It had been going on. Like, let's not, and mm-hmm. you know, say Marshawn. Like, it, it had been going on. And I think of, mm-hmm. you know, Aramis and and oh yeah, Miss Adrian Hood and like oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, Hannah and and then you think Absolutely. about like uh, Amber and yeah, sure. um. Yeah when you think of all of them and like Katie Smith had photos. And so we yeah. wound up having Devin Shaw like drum. Oh, wow. And I did like a 20 minute photo. Devin, a poet. Devin's poet. A too. poet. Yeah, yep. Yep. <laughs> every, you know, we, everybody, we all out here. It's, it's small, but it's like a very large community. And like he was drumming and there were 20 minutes of just photos of mm. all Columbus social mm. justice folks. Wow. And then we had dancers from Ohio oh State and the Lincoln Theater Incubation Program. And it was like, just to see, because I had them come in there. I was like, y'all ain't paying to get in. Y'all, y'all, this group of y'all that that do the on the ground, boots on the ground work, like y'all come and just get this love, right? And yeah. and so like yeah. they were front row and like mm. there were, there were t- it was one of the most beautiful things I had to like, I was watching kind of from the, the balcony oh, because wow. I just had, I came down and I had, you know, a set and I had a guitarist and I had backgrounds. So like we had a, we had a, it was like a nap, a protest, you know what I'm saying? It was all wow. kinds of stuff. And I just, there's, there comes a point when the writing has to match the times and that's Nina Simone, you know, like, Oh the, yeah. I just said that yesterday. In an interview. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. absolutely. Who was you interviewing with? Who's, who's <laughs> <doing? laughs> it was, it was my, uh, <laughs> It was my MFA program. It was Antioch. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they, they, I got asked that question about like, I don't even remember what the question was, but about like something about what does it mean to be an artist in these times? What does it mean to be a poet in these times? And I was like, well, Nina Simone told us we should be reflecting the times. Yes. And that if we're not reflecting the times, what are we doing? What you know? are we doing? And, and that goes back to like upholding community and mm-hmm. being, you know, carriers of history and culture bearers. Like, that that's the work we should be doing. That's the work we have to be doing. Like if we're mm-hmm. not reflecting the times, if we're not bearing witness, right, to what's right. happening and um, documenting, what are we doing? And that's another way to build, right? Mm-hmm. That's 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 the other way we're healing in this space is yes. by bearing witness and reflecting back to the community exactly what we're living in. Mm. You know? Well, I'm going to let you turn the tables. That was a perfect stopping point for the questions, <laughs> but I'm going to let you turn the tables for one thing. This is one thing that I do, and it's one of my favorite Ooh. things to do. So I, I flip the seat and I okay. ask you, and I'll give you a second to think about it, um, but I want you to give me a scenario. Um, we're very similar minded, so I'm curious what I'm going to do that you didn't do or anything like that, but you give me a scenario and it could be imagined or accurate and you can change names for the sake of um amnesty right and you tell me a scenario and you ask me what i would do and then we'll go revisit the scenario mm-hmm. and talk about what you did or would do if this is an imagined scenario oh my goodness what okay <laughs> it's called the situational hot seat situational hot, hot seat seat okay it has to be something that i did it can't be something somebody else did or it has to be something i did well, I mean, if you want to talk about something that someone else did, obviously change the names appropriately, but you can tell me that and then I'll tell you what I would have done. And then you tell me what you would have done. Okay. If that's the route you take. Okay. Okay, cool. Okay, cool, 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 cool. Okay. All right. Okay. This is funny. I don't know if this is funny or not. It's not funny, but I'm thinking okay. of a scenario because I'm just, I'm just wondering what you would have done as like a a healer, historian, Mm -hmm. culture bearer, that kind of thing. So um, there's a a open mic that was like going regularly. Mm -hmm. Um, Situation happens where the space all of a sudden closes. Uh. Host is nowhere to be found. Folks show up to the space. They can't, they can't get in, you know, um, and we have no clue like where the host is finally get in touch with the host they're actually they left they left the state they're not coming back right so now it's like oh crap what do we do like mm-hmm. we have a, a national scene that we can hold like there's 
all kinds of poets who want a space to share their their voices. Mm-hmm. Um, your partner looks at you and says, "You're the you're the person to do this. Like, what are you going to do? You have to make a decision. Mm-hmm. What do you do?" Oh, there was a scene. I had a situation similar to this kind of happen and um oh what I would do now is different than what I did then I think okay okay what I did then was make some phone calls and I didn't have capacity to do it and so I didn't Mm want to I didn't want to do it halfway so Mm -hmm. I I didn't um now the the first thing I think I would do with the information and the lived experience and the trauma-informed care and all that that I have now is there would be some like intentional repair or healing sought out from that situation like Mm -hmm. a space doesn't just close somebody just leaves town without some backstory and some context Mm -hmm. so I think before I would do anything I think there would need to be maybe a community meeting or maybe like Mm. the the original curators and producers or the people that had some like like back of the house knowledge I need to have a conversation because if the truth is I wouldn't want to take on anything if the if people had a certain taste in their mouth or Mm. a certain like connection to something bad that had happened I would need to Mm. have more information before I go putting my name on that and if there needed to be community repair then we can move about that transparently forward-facing messaging Mm. is one of the things that gets organizations people all of Mm. that in trouble and when people Mm. are like how do you decide what you say on social media like is it branded is it always branded I'm like this is why I started the podcast to have Mm. conversations because I don't think that social media has the bandwidth to mm-hmm. hold nuance and complexity. Right. And we are humans and we are messy. And um, sometimes people are leaving because of a personal situation and that mm-hmm. can be, but that can be explained. We're sometimes so scared of saying the hard thing or acknowledging like we're going to pause. Yeah, We're going to pause in reverence of the end of an era or the end of something beautiful that has happened and we're going to regroup and we'll let you know. And in the meantime, like have some slams, have some, some open mics in your garages. Mm. Like we're going to come back to it. Like, like get to writing because it's going to come back around and we got to figure out who the right person to carry this forward is. Right. So that, that to me is a step that we miss. And then we go, Mm. like, we feel like we, the pandemic really helped me with the slowing down. Like we feel like we have to move on And like, we can't move on if we don't heal from it. Just repeat the same mistakes. Right, right. And the the wound is not healed. And then the community is just coming in there. And then we're doing poetry from a a wounded place. We don't want that. We don't want that. So like, you know, that's, that's, that's that's what I would say about it. And I think now I also know at at 40 that um, the get somebody else to do it is such a really beautiful thing because I think... (laughs) There is, yes. there is the truth that people, some, the, the ship is always going to sail. That is some That's of the right. best advice, whether I'm on it or not, the ship is going to That's sail. Right. And do I think that there are some times when maybe it's a missed opportunity? Maybe, but mm. that doesn't mean that's the last opportunity that's going to come for me. And I think that scarcity mindset can get us wrapped up in some things that we can't get out of. And I've seen people want to get out of stuff. And yeah, I I just don't ever want to get caught up in something that I'm like, I feel obligated to do it because then I might be coming from a space of resentment. And then mm. it's not, it's not with my full heart. It's with mm. a part of my heart. And I'm mm. like questioning my decision. I'm questioning myself. Mm-hmm. I'm coming in like from that space and that's not grounded. And yeah. Full. Right. Right. That, that's so good. That is so, that is so good. And I think too, that's something that we're not really told how to do in, right. when we're in community, right? Is that I know coming up, it was like, well, if you don't do it, who's going to do it? If not now, if not, when? if not you, then who? What's right. going to happen? And that I, it took me a long time to undo that. Yep. That's a lie. That's actually not true. There's mm-hmm. actually 
tons of people who will do this. Mm -hmm. There's actually tons of people who are capable of doing it. There's actually tons of people who want to do it, right? So I don't have to do it. It's Mm -hmm. going to get done. If it's something that needs to happen in the earth Mm -hmm. and it's supposed to happen, it will get done. And it's okay to pause and take a moment to find the right person to be Mm -hmm. able to do it. It is okay. You know, that's that's a word for y'all. I don't know if y'all know, that. <laughs> but you just gave us a situation that just gave <laughs> us a word for everybody. And I just hope everybody just pauses, <laughs> just you pause, know, just take pause. a moment, take just a moment, pause, with take it. a moment and, and be mm-hmm. intentional. I have to like, I have to remind myself of that, like, because that's a cycle that I can get like wrapped in, like, oh, my gosh, like I have I have to. I have to. They said they said who else is going to do it? That's not true. Somebody like what is time doesn't. even anymore? Like it'll get done. Or it right. won't and it'll be fine. And y'all going to live. Look at <laughs> everybody. Gonna be, or look at everybody be. living or dying. Like look at everybody just existing. Existing. Right. In form <laughs> or in ash, you know? Like I don't know. <laughs> right. Right. But it it will be okay. It will yes. be it will be all right. That's a word for all of our nervous systems. Uh, This has been so delightful. Thank you so much for spending time with me. Um, Any any words for for the listeners if they've stayed on this long? Oh my gosh. If you have, thank you so much for listening. Um, Just thank you. Thank you. And um, where can I I find you? Oh yeah. Y'all can find me on IG and Facebook and Twitter. Um, It's at I am Barbara Fant. Uh, at I am Barbara Fant uh, and then um, barbarafant.com mm-hmm. is my website and I do put out newsletters I'm trying to be better about that so I'll be doing that more often and then um, you can find my book on Amazon or at Sundress Publications which is my publisher yes, it's so, a good one yeah. I got oh, it it's a good one you. of course as soon as it came out I was like give me that ah that means so much that is something to it's something to write something. It's another thing when people are actually buying it and they reading it. Right. You know what I'm saying? That's that's a whole nother nother, you know? So thank you. Have you thought about going in the studio for some of these? I have. I you have. need that voice. I'm like, I'm oh reading this goodness. and I'm sure it's nice how I'm reading it. But I really, I really want to hear Barbara's voice on this. What? Okay. Okay. I, I was going to work on like a, a audio version of it. And then yes. I started playing around with some music stuff. So yes. I'll probably be doing both. Yeah. Yay. Yeah. I'll be right there <laughs> to listen on my audibles. Hey, I out. appreciate that. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you so much. This For sure. Good. Well, you've been a pleasure. This has been delightful. And oh, um, I can't wait to see what's next. Thanks yes. y'all for listening. Thank you.